kind of something out of um, my time as I did an occupational therapy internship with a program like ours in New Hampshire. And so I kind of took all these like things I learned on the ground there from the people who had experience and then took my theories from school and married them together in this presentation. And I hope there's gonna be um, some takeaways for you all uh, as far as things you can use on your lessons with sensory and behavior challenges. Uh, so as an OT, I'm kind of trained to look at things by like, where can I jump in and adjust to meet this person's needs and give them the best experience possible. So we can do that by building individual skills. And that's in like the things you're gonna learn on the snow with training. Uh, how do you even break down a beginner progression and teach someone how to ski? Uh, movement analysis, those kinds of things. We can also adapt the task or the requirements. So we can make skiing look a little bit different by looking at um, our equipment lessons. like if people need physical adaptations to get out there on the hill, um, that would be kind of changing the task. And then the other piece that's sometimes a little more elusive is creating a supportive environment for that student. And we can do some of that by looking at some sensory and behavior um, theories and kind of use those in practice on the snow. And the goal is to create the best ski lesson ever by kind of combining all of those areas. Okay, so the goals tonight are um, to be able to identify the types of sensory input, uh, learn some kind of standard sensory processing patterns that you can start picking out um, in real time. We're gonna have a little sensory overload simulation kind of learn how that influences his behavior and then dig into some strategies where you can start approaching this stuff um, and also some behavioral approaches. So hopefully that we're gonna increase everyone's comfort with behavior lessons um, and addressing sensory needs. And I'm gonna try, we have a, cool thing that pull everywhere. So um, if everyone has their phone, let's just see how this works. Um, and hopefully at home, it's work gonna work as well. It's just a little QR code. Are you guys able to pick that up? Is it? Um, maybe I can, huh? How can I make it bigger, Patrick? Huh? How do I do that? Wait. And then how do I move this? Drag the green part, click and hold, drag it to the bottom. Okay. Okay, does that work better? So I just kind of want to see where everyone's starting out with their comfort level with these. The internet people to do it too. Yeah, hopefully the can the internet people are they seeing it? Is yeah. Okay. I'm gonna make you guys get up a lot tonight. <laughs> get closer to it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so we kind of have a mix of um, people who it's really new for or maybe have had some experience. So hopefully there's going to be opportunities tonight to share what those experiences might have been. Um, and we can we're going to like workshop a few scenarios. So um, my goal is really that this will kind of reinforce some things, you know, already and then just give you some new ideas um, to feel the most prepared you can feel. Awesome. Okay, so 
Um, many of our participants, like why this is important is that a lot of them are gonna have sensory and behavior challenges. You might see it on their actual paperwork as like a sensory diagnosis. For some of the younger kids, that's become more common. Um, it's also really common with ADHD, anxiety, autism. Um, and in our older clients, like you might not see that on the paperwork because sensory is like a newer thing that we've been talking about, but it still exists. Um, and this really affects how people meaningfully participate in activities. So we want you to be as prepared as possible to um, really influence and create a shared experience that's positive. Um, make your lessons more fun and functional. That's the big goal. Um, and you can even think of this as like another piece of adaptive equipment or adaptive tool. Um, like you are gonna be more adaptive is kind of the goal here. Um, so what, when I say sensory input, what comes to mind? And people can put it in the chat too online. I think it's like clothes for me, especially. Yeah, like clothing, like the tactile input, totally. Too much sound. Sound for sure. Taste. Yeah, totally. And one of the drinking counts at one of the schools I went to, there was, it was a university, so they had this like, how to calm your mind type paper on it. And it said, you know, hear where you are, what you hear, what you feel, what you smell, like all of these things. So sight, feel, all that sort of stuff. What temperature is it? Totally, yeah. Those are all like really important. We're getting senses from all these different areas and tuning into those can be a really grounding thing to do. Um, there's also a couple other types of sensory input that most people like haven't heard of in their daily life. And um, I think they're super important for the work we're doing. One is proprioception. So the there's receptors in your joints that tell your body where they are in space, basically. So this is related to timing, sequencing, um, force of limb movement. It's really important for coordination to understand like proprioceptive input. And you get a lot of it from like push-ups or heavy work. Um, anything where you're like really in tune with where your joints are. Vestibular refers to um, stimulation. It's in your inner ear. There's like little cilia that the fluid in your inner ear canals moves it. So that's kind of how you know where your head is in space. Um, and that's really important for balance and body movement. Um, and that is huge when we're skiing. So what, we do have one kiddo who... Um, his, he doesn't have those cilia um, or they're underdeveloped. And so his vestibular system like doesn't get much input at all. And once we start sliding on skis, he'll just like flop over to the side. Um, so it's a really important sense for figuring out balance. And then interoception is a fancy word for anything that's going on inside. So hunger, thirst, bowel, bladder, um, and that is another really important one. We want to kind of address those needs um, at the beginning of the lesson, hopefully, um, so those don't come out in the middle as behavior. Um, and then we all have individual differences in how we process sensory input. Um, and modulation refers to your ability to kind of organize that input and regulate it. So, um, we all kind of modulate differently as well. Um, and I think now I'm gonna have you all, it's just sort of how you make sense of it, input. I'm gonna try to go back to our polling thing. And if this becomes too clumsy, I will let it go, but I really wanna try to use it because it's pretty cool. Um, okay, now, how do I get out of here? Exit. I swear I practiced this. So this one is going to have a few questions in a row. So just sort of take your time um, filling that out. Uh, there's four questions, I believe. And I got these from a tool that we use in OT all the time to assess uh, sensory in people. So. Um, 
there's different categories and I just pulled one question from each category so that we can get a sense of um, just the variation that's here in this room and in the, the Zoom tonight. And I think the next button is like at the top of each question. And then when you're finished, you'll be able to click finish and I'll be able to see that they're done. Bless you. I think that everyone's almost wrapped up here so we can start looking um, just at the variability in our group. So I like to go places that have bright lights and are colorful. Um, in this spectrum, we have somebody in every single one of these categories, which is kind of cool. A lot of people really like bright lights. Um, Tice, we have a lot of spicy liking people in this group too. I'm definitely one of those almost always. Uh, but again, it's like we've got people in all different categories. Um, movement. So I avoid elevators and escalators because I dislike movement. Um, this one, I always tend to see this result because we're like in a ski community. So a lot of us are drawn here because we like these like movement activities. Um, but it's cool because you might see yourself in these four different categories having really different answers. Um, the clothing one, this one comes up a lot for our students, um, especially because we have to add a lot more clothing for winter and that can complicate things. Um, and we have a lot of people here that get uncomfortable in certain fabrics too. So um, the main point of that is really just to show that these differences are um, totally normal um, as far as like not everyone has the same experience. And so it's really good to approach understanding that even if you're regulated and you're not feeling like too warm in a room, somebody else might be. So, um, and the results from this sensory profile put you in these different categories that I'll kind of explain what the categories are here. Um, we can have variations in our threshold for registration. So if someone has a really low threshold, they're inundated with so much stimuli. Like they're not filtering out things. They're gonna feel that tag in their clothes and they're gonna like feel the hair wisps on their skin and they're gonna hear something that's happening, a conversation in the next room. They're gonna hear everything. A high threshold means that they're just like missing a lot of stimuli. Um, so things just aren't really getting through. Then we also have variations in that behavioral response. So a passive response is they're not gonna really do anything to change that experience. And an active response means they're gonna be seeking out more input that they need or really avoiding it. And they create these patterns. Um, there are evolutionary benefits to having these variations in a group, which is really interesting. Um, I liked this study a lot. So it kind of showed that the low threshold so um, getting a ton of information and having an active, or sorry, yeah, and having an active response, seeking it out is um, a timely protective reaction to threat. Whereas someone with that higher threshold that's not getting inundated, they're able to maintain a calm state and support others. So it's kind of nice to remember that these things like have benefits too. 
Um, and this is basically what I just said. So the, the side here is going to be the threshold. So down here, they're going to be getting a ton of input. And then if it's higher threshold, they're missing things. And then the past, the response is going to be on the top. So we're kind of going to look at what this might look like. So the first student you're thinking about is learning slowly because they don't notice what's going on or understand the directions. That might mean that they have, they're missing stimuli and they're not trying to figure out more. The next person, which I'm sure we've all seen this person in the hut if we've been up there on the weekends, it, um, I wanna touch everything and ski fast and they're on the move and they're eager for the next thing. They're just like hungry for more and more stimulation. Um, that person is probably missing some stimuli and in active pursuit of getting more and more sensory, sensory experiences. So both of these people on the top of the grid are going to benefit from increased sensory input. So we kind of treat them in the same way, whether they're like missing things or they're missing things and really seeking it out. Um, the next person can't pay attention because their helmet's hot and their boots are heavy and they might be not saying those things to you, but that's kind of what's going on inside um, and they're uncomfortable and we're just not getting anywhere um, because they're really agitated. So that person is really inundated and distractible generally. And then the, I don't want to try this, it's too new. Um, this can look like bolting, it can look like lashing out, it can be physical aggression, verbal, um, anything like that. That person might just be inundated with sensory stimuli and doing anything they can to avoid it. So once we start kind of thinking in these quadrants, um, you can kind of begin to think of like which tools you're going to use for which person. Um, and so both these people on the bottom are going to in, uh, benefit from decreasing the sensory stimulation and making the environment more calm. Um, and I actually have a handout that's got like all this stuff on, so you don't have to remember it. Um, and it might, it has the same picture. We're going to come back to this too, when I give you like specific, um, tools for each person and anyone that's in the chat that wants the handout can just put their email in and then I'll at the end of I tonight huh I just shared it. oh you did already okay Patrick's ahead of me okay perfect um oh fun okay so next is our little uh sensory overload simulation Actually, I want to ask. Tapioca comes from the cassava plant and has been used for centuries in creamy puddings and sweet desserts. Tapioca contains no impurities, so the delicate taste will not last like flavor, so do not try lemon. As a pudding, this tapioca is very soothing and it's warm or delightfully refreshing when chilled. One half cup. Play button where it says resume share in the middle of the bar there. Oh, well, that's a stop share. Yeah. Resume yeah. share. Okay, I don't know how I did that, but I can start it over. There. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> no, it said I was paused. Let's see. Tapioca comes from the cassava plant and has been used for centuries in creamy puddings and sweet desserts. Tapioca contains no impurities, so the delicate taste will not mask light flavors such as vanilla, peach, or lemon. As a pudding, Reese tapioca is divinely soothing when served warm or delightfully refreshing when chilled. One half cup Reese tapioca, quarter teaspoon of salt, two eggs separated, two and a half cups milk. Half cup sugar, one teaspoon vanilla. Just one. In a large bowl, soak tapioca in two cups of room temperature water overnight. Drain water. Step two. 
In a double boiler, heat milk just until no longer cold. Add salt and tapioca. Continue heating until small bubbles appear at the sides of the pan. Cover, turn heat to very low, and cook for one hour. Make sure that the milk mixture does not simmer or boil. Step three, separate egg whites from yolks. Beat egg yolks and sugar together until light yellow in color. Add a little of the hot mixture to the egg yolks and blend thoroughly. Then add the yolk mixture to the hot milk mixture, stirring constantly. Place the double boiler over medium heat and cook until the hot milk mixture is very thick, about 15 minutes. Step four, beat egg whites until stiff. Slowly fold the egg whites into the hot tapioca mixture. Stir in vanilla. Serve warm or chilled. Make six to eight servings. Okay. So now that you've listened to that nonsense, uh, I'm going to put up a quiz on it. Does anyone know why I can't click on that? Have you tried keep hovering over it with the cursor? Total mystery. Shoot. Well, we'll see if that works. I thought the video was quite nice. <laughs> Not overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> That's something we do um, in person. You might be doing an activity like this in your new volunteer training as well. Um, but that was kind of my best attempt to make it work for virtual and in person. Um, so we didn't have the tactile input, but there's plenty of visual and auditory. <laughs> And, um, you know, obviously that was sort of exaggerated, but considering like right now you feel regulated and or in any moment where you feel regulated, your participant may actually be perceiving the world around them in a way that feels a lot like that. Um, so that's kind of our, we're going to break down how we give directions and um, check in and make sure that it doesn't feel like that. So we'll kind of go through <laughs> the, I mean, and also like, I didn't tell you that you're going to be tested necessarily or what to listen for. Right. So um, answers are going to be totally across the board on that. Um, and I could say, well, I just read you the whole recipe. Like I read you the whole thing just now. So why didn't you capture that? Right. Um, but we're across the board on every single question. Um, and yeah, so this is how it feels, right? Um, and the word cloud is set up to show like a word that's repeated more is going to be bigger. So overwhelmed, confused. Um, it was kind of amusing. That's my little niece. She's a little older now, but she's so stinking cute. Um, so I use her for a lot of things. <laughs> Um, stressed, yeah, so didn't hear attention. Um, it's a frustrating experience, and the goal really is just to check in with our participant and make sure that's not how they're experiencing our lessons with them. Um, and then, in do you want, can we do some breakout rooms for this, Patrick? How many people are here in the 12? Uh, or 12 on the call. Okay, so maybe we'll just do, um, 
like each table can kind of chat for a second and then we can do two or three rooms, whatever you think. Um, and basically I just wanna hear like well, how you're feeling. Um, do you think your own tendency for seeking or avoiding factored into that experience? Um, and what could I have done to set you up more for success? Yeah, um, what were you thinking and feeling? Yeah. Do you think your own tendency for seeking, avoiding, uh, factored into the experience? <laughs> I Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, uh, does anyone from the groups want to kind of share out, um, or are they back? Oh, <laughs> guys, this is not my strength. <laughs> great sensory overload, isn't it? it honestly, Gil, yeah, it is. Hey, listen, it's back. It's expected. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, does anyone from the groups want to share out a little bit? That can be on here. You can unmute yourself um, or from the these groups either. One of the things that we talked about that- Talk nice and loud for the- One of the things that- we talked about was meeting people where they're at. And so you'll use your skills of empathy and putting yourself in another person's position. And you might be familiar with the layout of the hut in Bridger Bowl Eagle Mount. But if you're not, and you're there for the first time, there's lots of people that can be an overwhelming experience. And so just being mindful of the people that you're with and just allowing yourself kind of the time and almost the grace to just meet them where they're at rather than trying to pull other people to your speed and, and your energy in that moment. Totally. Yeah, I think that's hopefully one of the biggest takeaways from today is like matching your energy with the person that you're with. I think that's awesome. Um, and if anyone has like had a lesson experience too that they want to share, because I know it's a mixture of returning um, and newer folks, that's always helpful. Anyone? No pressure, but. Love to hear from the virtual one. Sandy, do you want to say something? Hi, yeah. Um, from experience, it's also, you know, you try to match them, but if you're all hyped up and it just makes them worse, you know, if you don't stay calm and, and you can't expect them to get calm and lower their, their sensory of, um, if you're all frustrated and trying to do this and that, and you know, it's just like playing with a dog that um, you're trying to calm a dog down, but you're yelling at it. Obviously, we don't yell at the kids, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great distinction. So if if the you are trying to bring the energy down, that's okay too. Um, but we don't want to like come in hot. I think too is what Jake was saying. Um, too hot for the person. So that's a really great distinction. Come on in, Jody. Yeah, Jody. Well, <laughs> no, you were okay. unmuted. Okay. But I was saying, um, am I still muted? No, no. you're good. Yeah, you. Um, oh, now I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, it's like it's the it's it's kind of like the theory of like you know when a kid when you have a little toddler they fall all the time when they're first learning how to walk right, and you see them and they walk and you and they fall over. And they hit the, you know, they bang their knee or whatever. And the adults all around go, <gasps> and of course the kid is going to like freak out. Right. But if you just go, oh, you're okay. You know, it's kind of like, that's, a, you know, like what Sandy was saying. Totally. Yeah. A phrase I really like for that concept is like, let someone borrow your calm. 
So try to have enough calm for yourself in the situation and that you can share a little bit too. These are mirror neurons. Mirror neurons, yes, yeah. Jake. I swear that's not made of I know, it's exactly yeah. right. Awesome. Uh, well, let's pop back in if I can find my, oh gosh, now I need to learn how to do this. Share screen. Okay, so as we've sort of chatted, a lot of, it makes sense that this like sensory challenges would lead to behavior challenges, right? Because when you're dysregulated, it's going to come out some way. Um, and this study that I'm referencing on this slide uh, is on sensory processing in the general population. Um, and sensory processing differences relate to anxiety. So no one um, specific quadrant from that grid is a predictor of anxiety, but anyone who's an extreme representation in any of those patterns, um, it leads to anxiety. And then sensory seeking, which is often seen as problematic behavior and oftentimes kids get punished for seeking behavior is actually related to fewer depressive behaviors and increased resilience. So it's nice to remember that this is actually them like actively coping. So if we can harness that energy and try to steer it in a direction that is positive, um, that's gonna be meeting their needs better than trying to like punish that seeking behavior. In a like context of a lesson, mm -hmm. how would you redirect that, especially if your kiddo wants to speed down the hill? Totally. <laughs> um, it's tough, like, right? We're going to try to brainstorm some ideas and groups for that, okay. um, for sure, because I want to hear not just me telling everyone, like, there's so much knowledge in this room and online, and um, so we'll kind of come up with some solutions together, but um, trying to think of, like, something that meets that need for speed and excitement that is in a safe direction. Sure. Um, and so it can look like different things. Like you can use, um, you know, the area near Flurry that's like near the snowflake hut and do like little foot races or something like where their skis are off and they're not gonna go careening down the hill. Um, it's okay to like take ski breaks and, and do like movement. Um, Cause maybe their skills on skis hasn't caught up to their need for the sensory input. So it's okay. Like if you take a break and do something that meets those needs. Um, sensory avoiding is related to decreased resilience, decreased adaptability and more frequent like aggression, hyperactivity behaviors. And so um, the point there being that someone who is that sensory avoiding that's refusing things, running away, is probably just always gonna need more scaffolding from you to, um, to be successful. Um, and presence of a diagnosis, and in this study it was uh, ADHD and anxiety, um, is related to decreased adaptability independent of the sensory factors. So uh, just knowing that our, our students might not be as adaptable. Um, and, and just helping them adapt with some strategies that we'll go over. So let's see. You wanna start observing your student as soon as you see them. So uh, if they're kind of wandering around the room, not listening, start thinking like, oh, maybe they're low registration. If they're stomping, touching things, getting into the games, impatient, they might be seeking and those, we're both going to want to provide more sensory input. If they're really agitated, easily distracted, they might be sensory sensitive. And then um, the protesting, sensory avoiding. So that, those are the students we're going to try to remove the overwhelming sensory input. So this is kind of back to our grid. Um, and it is a really ongoing process. It takes creativity, patience. Um, you might have something that worked amazing one day and then it's like not gonna hit the spot the next week. So you kind of just have to be gracious with yourself too because it's an ongoing process. 
So for those people, yeah, Jake. Really quickly, one thing that I think is maybe a parallel to that that we all are probably fairly familiar with is thinking about group dynamics, where if you're going to, again, be sort of overstimulated, maybe reducing the size of the group, you know, take a person out of the main hut area and pull them to the side so that they can put their boots on. Or in the inverse, if someone really reacts positively to having other people around them and is energized by that, then maybe try and make the group activity out of it. Totally. Um, that's a really good point. Even though all our lessons are one-on-one, -on -one, um, if there is somebody that like that person finds motivating, it's okay to like bunch up. And as long as we're keeping people in safe terrain, um, I had a kid who was at my last place. She didn't wear pants. She only wore dresses and skirts, which was problematic on the snow. And so she we found a peer for her that she really wanted to ski with and so we ended up getting some pajama pants under the skirt so that she could go out skiing um, with her friend so using like the peer groups or you know if like you said if it's overstimulating moving away from the groups like we try to make spaces that are sensory friendly um so we're going to think of turning up the volume when we think of increasing sensor input. And it's not just auditory, but the volume in every aspect you can think of. Um, that can be your tone, facial expressions, just the energy that you bring to it. Those people who are, are seeking or missing things, you want to bring, bring a lot. Um, and it's, you'll know pretty quickly if the person is in this category or if that was too much and you can back off too. Um, you can use attention grabbing props. Both mountains have lots of toys. Um, make yourself the most interesting thing out there. I love skiing around with the big hands there. I meant to bring them tonight. They're foam and they're like this big and you can do high-fiving activities or like follow me activities, red light, green light. Um, just bring some, some different energy into it. Preferred objects and games. So on this lesson, this uh, young man I was skiing with didn't have really a particular interest in skiing. His dad really wanted him to ski. So it was a long two hours, or I think I might have even been a full day lesson I was with him. Um, but he loved football. And so I brought out these squishy footballs and used them one was as a reward. He wanted to play catch. And so we would, after he did some skiing, we would play catch. But another tool that I use, um, his body positioning was like very straight up and down, leaning back, not really leaning into his boots. So skiing was really scary because he wasn't in control of his skis. So we ended up putting a football between his knees and he had to squeeze it. And that got him into the athletic positioning. Um, and I brought two balls because I had to give him like the visual cue to what the heck I was asking him to do. And so I skied in front with my football and he followed and it ended up being a really positive day. And um, his family got him to go to another resort back home where they lived. Um, and I think a lot of it was because we met those those needs and made it engaging. And like, once he was leaning into his boots, it felt a lot safer. Um, you can also take a lot of active breaks. So this is kind of what you were asking about, Jackie. Um, these are a couple games. One was a kiddo with using independent um, by ski outriggers. We would play snowball baseball. So he'd kind of get bored of just doing laps on the bunny hill, but that's where we were in the progression. And when we were stopped, we'd have him balance himself and we'd throw snowballs. He'd get points for how many he would hit with his outriggers. And little did he know we were working on like all his balance and stability and everything at the same time. Um, but then he was earning points for things later. I think his mom would like pay him in gummy bears or something. Um, and then the kiddo on the bottom had um, really low muscle tone. And so it was really hard for him to stay engaged in, in skiing for the full time, um, but he also needed a lot of stimulation or we'd lose him, like he was bored, he was done. So we did a lot of 
snow angels, things like that. And he got a lot, he got rest what he, his muscles needed, but he's still playing with us and he's getting all this input from the snow and the cold um, and just kept it engaging that way. And you can think about uh, the cues that you give with someone that's low registry or has that high threshold, um, visual demonstrations plus auditory directions, plus those kinesthetic cues like the um, football I was talking about. Um, there's all kinds of fun games you can do with, with kinesthetic cues too. So that's all for turning up the volume. And then I kind of wrote this out because it's all going on your handout. So like, I know this is not a good slide for a PowerPoint, but it's just in there because it, I wanted you to have take. Oh yeah, so I have it for in the hut and then on snow, like, the lift can be a really long time for those kids that need a lot of sensory input. So like thinking of, does anyone have like good chairlift games they wanna share? Jokes. Jokes? Yeah, do you have like a lot in your head or do you bring a, a, a sheet? Nice, that is awesome. Um, maybe that's something we can even provide is like weekly jokes. I can like print some out for you guys to take with you on your lessons. Um, I love that idea, yeah. How many towers are there on this lift? Yes. Do you think there's more than three towers between us and the top of the lift? Counting towers? Four towers. You never know. I was going to say, like, rock, paper, scissors or something. Something of that sort where they can fix a tactile. Yeah, rock, paper, scissors. That's a great idea because they're moving. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, well, like, there's, like, would you rather this or that, like, chocolate or vanilla, like, and then you just start learning more about each other, too, um, so that's really fun. I've got some um, scavenger hunts, too, that I can have printed out more readily available, but it's stuff you can spot from the lift, so, like, looking for a certain color, snow pants, or, like, things you might, it might take all day to find those things, so it keeps it engaging. Um, so now we'll kind of talk about these people in the lower threshold category. So where there's just tons of sensory input coming. And for these folks, we really want to think about turning down the volume in all those same areas. So this is when you kind of want to choose whether you're giving visual demonstrations auditory directions or tactile cues. Um, sometimes for people overlapping those things can be really overwhelming. So I had a kiddo that I was giving auditory directions as he was skiing and he was all over the place. Like it was an absolute mess. And then I started at the top of the run, I would say, this is what we're gonna work on and do a little visual and, and auditory there and then when he started skiing down, I would just stop talking and ski in front of him. And I had another volunteer kind of behind me or behind him to watch. But then he just cued into my movements and followed me down the whole way. Um, so it was my talking that was like really messing him up. Um, and I think it's important to remember, like, we're always giving cues, whether we mean to or not. And so a lot of this takes some like introspection too, or like putting, like being like, what am I putting out there? Um, yeah, you can choose quieter spots to practice things, avoid the base areas if you can, like pick a gentle area to do things in. Um, and this is for someone who's really overwhelmed, right? And then your timer. Yeah, Jake. Deep breaths. We're going to take six. Into nose, out to mouth. Yeah, breath is super powerful. Um, and you might find that a lot of these kids have those strategies because a lot of our students are in OT at school or have like a classroom teacher who does those things. So um, you'll see like them bringing in their own techniques. So you can ask them too what 
what they like to do, but the, the breathing together is huge for co-regulation. That's a really good one. Um, we have like your timer. So like giving someone a break and being like, I'm not going to talk to you for two minutes. Like you get two minutes of quiet time. Then they know that you're going to come back. You know, it's like very predictable when you start using a timer. Um, it's a great tool. And it also takes the pressure off of you being the one that's in control. It's like on this other thing that's going to be, or at Bridger, we have like the sand ones in the hut so people can see how much time they have left. Um, and we have two sensory rooms there. So you're always welcome to use those for a calm down time. Um, as far as movement goes, slow linear movement is going to be the most calming. Um, and that could be something like we have a rocking chair at Bridger um, that can be used or um, this family that I skied with, the mom was not as good a skier. So she had a hard time keeping up with us and he would cry every time I stopped and waited for her on the trail. But the family's goal was to try to like stay together and be on this experience together. So once I kind of figured out I could just like rock his ski while we were moving and then I would like slowly transition it into moving again. And same thing when we came to a stop, um, he was like a different kid. He was so happy and um, he was nonverbal. So it took like some trial and error to figure out getting to that point and asking his family, like, what does it look like when he's happy? What does it look like when he's upset? Does he like this type of movement? Um, and we got there in a couple of runs and the rest of the day was like really positive. Um, oh, and then touch. So with permission to touch, we never like touch people without permission. I wanna be super clear about that. But um, deep pressure, like you can provide on somebody's shoulders or their joints, um, but in telling them to self hug or like see how tight they can squeeze. Um, you could squeeze their hands if they like that feeling do a push up, like do push ups together, put like any of that heavy work is really, really grounding. Um, light touch is really stimulating. So thinking about like if maybe some of their garments are like if they have a loose scarf on, that can be like really triggering. Um, the other day my husband was sitting on the couch next to me and his toe was like touching my leg just a little bit and like really inconsistently. And I was like, I, my threshold has been that, like I need either deep pressure or like no touch. And I was like, okay, <laughs> he's pretty used to being married to an OT, but um, you know, your student might not be as clear with like knowing what that feeling is. So being like investigative and like, trying to figure these out. It's like a puzzle all the time. One, one challenge of a lot is getting to keep the goggles on. And do you have any suggestions on how to get work? Well, that's such a tricky one because it is both, right? Goggles on and goggles up when there's sun and wind and snow are total sensory overloads, right? Um, I think we are gonna look into some, there's these new helmets that have like, a shield rather than goggles um, yeah visors so we're going to look into getting something like that um because i think that is a huge like the sensory piece is the goggles that's a very common issue um that's a tricky one <laughs> yeah they are totally optional but then sometimes when you take them off and if it's like a windy day up there the wind and snow can be just as awful um and you can always like come in and reset and get like a dry pair of goggles like we have a lot of different sizes too so we can always play with things like that um, but i would love to get some visors and i don't know if there's like any that are aftermarket that can go on other helmets that wouldn't be like as intense. I don't know. We'll get to that. Um, Patrick, anything in the chat recently? Uh, just to repeat some of the questions. Oh, okay. I'm not good at that. I'll try to be better. Um, again, these are like all on the handout. Um, 
And then this is kind of a chart that's also on the handout and it shows you like which things turn up the volume or down the volume in each sensory category that we've gone over. Um, so I really like referring to this, kind of like knowing what tools to have in your toolbox. Let me just think for a second. Okay, so it's kind of where we shift into the behavior side of things. All behavior is communication. So it's not like the most effective communication all the time. Like you don't necessarily know right away what someone's communicating, but it is communication. Um, and that's like the important thing to remember. Uh, it's not about you or like this person doesn't like you or something. It's it's them communicating a need that's not being met. Um, and so just kind of like remembering that thought in the moment, I find really helpful for um, then addressing behaviors. The function of behavior is usually for one of two main things. They're trying to gain attention or escape or avoid what's going on. And that could be a task they don't want to do, or it could be the sensory stuff um, or like interpersonal. And um, reinforcement is really, really powerful and we're doing it unintentionally all the time. So things that can reinforce problematic behaviors are then like giving them the attention they want, right? Like the eye contact, raised voice, negative tone, all these things that you feel like are trying to redirect a behavior are actually reinforcing it. So we're gonna kind of look at how we can prevent behaviors and also um, prevent reinforcing them by trying to ignore those behaviors whenever it's safe to do that. So um, the ABC model is like, I think really helpful for thinking about behaviors. Um, the A is like antecedent, so the event occurring right before the behavior. So this is like the trigger. Um, what happened, what led up to that behavior? B is the specific observations of it. And then C is the consequence. So what, how is this then reinforced? What was the outcome? And we'll do a little ski example. So the participant has shown some signs of fatigue at the top of the magic carpet area. You decide they have to do one more drill of your choosing before they can have a break. Then the participant bolts away from you down the hill. They don't hit any other skiers, but they are out of control and you have to race down after them. They're not turning, they're not slowing down, just pointing towards the lodge, going fast. Can you tell this has happened to me? <laughs> Um, the consequence, it was reinforced right away, right? They got to ski fast. They avoided doing the drill that you said they had to do. Now they're at the bottom and they're getting that break they wanted. So um, it's, it works out. It's, uh, that was pretty reinforced. So I want to just kind of pose, um, I have like a little poll for what were, what are some outcomes or some choices you can make to um, address that behavior differently. And then we can, um, there wasn't like an open-ended, I couldn't add one open-ended to this one. So if anyone has like an idea they want to share, please do. There's no right or wrong answers here. How's like the percentage of being changed? How is it? Yeah. Because as it's like, so if you have a phone, you can scan this QR code oh. and do the answer. Sorry, you missed the super yeah, beginning part. Yeah, if you scan that, you can um, 
like see the choices and vote. So um, it, there is kind of a nice spread on, on these answers. Um, <clears throat> and the first couple are really addressing that A part, right? Like it's trying not to create a situation where this person doesn't have choices because that was the trigger, right? Is like, I said, you have to do this drill that I picked out before you get your break. And they're like, no, I don't. Um, and so anything that you can do to address a behavior in that like trigger area is gonna be way more effective. Um, you can, you know, try to prevent it from being reinforced. But in this case, um, like the act in itself is so reinforcing is like, so you want to really try to be in that preventative area. Um, once they've engaged in the behavior, they're like, oh, okay, I got what I wanted. I think that having a discussion about what you do after that sort of what you could potentially call negative behavior is definitely helpful because to me, I think it's you know, the internal challenge that any parent or any person would ever face that is kind of in a teaching or educational environment. And to me, one of the things that I think is really important is being clear about the fact that that behavior is considered a quote negative behavior because that way there's a sense of accountability, especially in an environment like people now where you'll oftentimes have participants who have been here for years and years and years and the support staff kind of moves in now. You can have, I think, a sense of kind of, okay, well, you know, the rules are always changing. Everyone is going to have a different approach. They're going to try and tell me what to do. And so just engaging with the person honestly, hey, this seemed like it was pretty scary. You know, did you feel like you were in control while you were skiing down that hill? And one of the things that we talked about at Eagle Mount is that safety is the number one priority, and you know that. And so trying to get buy-in and, again, just being clear, you, know, you don't need to, to shoot people out or anything like that, but it helps, I think, in the aftermath. Totally. I don't know if the people um, at home could hear everything Jake said, but um, really good point about debriefing these situations with your student and letting them know that you have clear boundaries and I like those questions you asked that are kind of self-assessment, right? Like, did you feel like that was a safe choice? Um, were you in control? And um, getting that buy-in is going to help a lot for your relationship moving forward. Um, so I think those are really great points. Um, and here's just a few strategies as far as uh, just creating a relationship that in a, in a lesson environment that is going to have fewer behaviors if you kind of follow these tenants. Um, matching demands to abilities is really huge. Like, don't try to ask too much of someone. But then if you're making things too easy, the boredom can be like a big trigger for behaviors too. So really trying to like find that just right challenge um, for your student is, it takes some time, but it's, um, it's huge. And then sharing control, offering choices as much as you can, um, you know, and it's nice when you can give choices that you want all of the outcomes, but then they still have the choice of like, it's not like, oh, we're going on bridge or lift or Virginia city. It's like, oh, which of these VC runs should we do next? Um, that kind of thing. Not like fully open-ended choices. Um, and then that environment to pr promote success. So all those sensory and types of cues are going to go a long way for preventing behaviors. Having really clear communication, which also Jake brought up in that comment, um, kind of using simple language, not talking down to somebody, but just like being clear in what your expectations are. Um, you want to be really like clear. <laughs> And then supporting self-regulation. So the breathing techniques, um, having like 
a physical like let's do our push-ups or whatever things kind of bring that person back to being grounded um and then recognize and reward the behaviors that are going really well um there's no day that's like all bad for these kids and so you know um Patrick and I work with one person who has a lot of behavior challenges and um, pretty significant uh, issue when he ran away from me. I had to get ski patrol involved. He was climbing a tree under the Virginia City lift um, and he could not save face with me anymore at that moment. So I had called Patrick and ski patrol and then Patrick happened up on us and was like, hey, and then the kiddo was like, oh, hey, Patrick, what are you doing here? Um, and then they went off and did their, their skiing and I took Patrick's group. And so it's like, we don't want anyone to be like punished for these things. Like, because he ran away from me, Patrick's not gonna then give him like negativity, right? Like he's gonna meet him with as much positive energy. Um, and you can always use your co-volunteer for kind of changing that energy. You can always call the hut um we're happy to come in I've had many like negotiations um I'll, I'll, I'll come out and you know what is your coach telling you are they telling you this because it's a safety boundary you know and we we can get there so you're always welcome to call us in for things like that um and then we want to just like try to allow them for the positive things even if it's been like a tough morning or something um, and then ignoring problematic behaviors when it's possible or safe. Um, this one comes up a lot with language. There's, you know, a tendency to be like, oh, we don't talk like that at Eagle Mount. And that might trigger that person like to the absolute next level. So just ignoring it is the best thing that you can do. If it's making other students feel unsafe, like trying to pick a different area get into the sensory room something like that um but usually directly being like we don't talk like that is actually not helpful um and then some resources so um for increasing predictability and clarifying expectations we can use things like um, a picture story or schedule and first then language so um we have um, like first then is really easy to use in the moment. You don't need a tangible thing to do it. But if you know, you're in a situation where you have to ski down to somewhere before they can get what they want, like it'll be like first skiing, then um, song or something like that. Like if the, if you don't have the music with you, um, but kind of like, taking a lot of the words out that aren't as important and talking, like making it a big discussion, it can be really helpful to just remove all of that and be like, first skiing, then songs. Um, I use that one a lot. And then the picture schedule, we actually have, um, we're gonna like use some in a little scenario in a minute that we can then, I'm gonna have available at the hut. So this one was for someone who like, hated going back to their second lesson they did like full day lessons and so they could see like getting dressed was part of the problem right so they could check off and see how much more they had to accomplish before they could go home and we have them on velcro so they're you can make them for each person and you can even like pluck them off once they've completed that part and so then they can just see how many steps they have left yeah jake other idea is have your plan figured out before you're on the lift with the snow and the cold. <laughs> and so talk about it with your participant or their family when you're in the hut. And then you say, okay, we agree on this. And then hopefully that person says, yeah, I'm it. And then that way, again, you have that agreement that you can always go back to and say, hey, yeah, I love that. And just for other folks at home too, um, making that plan in the hut, agreeing on it, getting the buy-in before it feels like you're out there in the snow, it's unpredictable, um, and you have a disagreement out there. So I think that's huge. Just knowing what to expect is a huge piece of this stuff. 
Um, you can use rewards and those can be stickers. We have like a treasure trove of stickers. Um, and sometimes like kids like putting stickers on their volunteers helmet. Like if you're open to that kind of thing, like it, and it helps with the relationship too. Um, we do a lot of that. And then that timer, like always remember you have the timer um, and you can always call us for help. Okay. okay. And then your role. So you guys are the most valuable resource. Like there's so much knowledge um, in these groups. And if you're a new volunteer, you'll probably be paired with someone who's been doing it for a while. Um, and so just relying on each other and using all those perspectives too. If you're a new volunteer, don't be afraid to share and you might have had these experiences, it doesn't have to be on snow. Um, you might have really great ideas too. And you can pull things from these clinics, from your new ball training. Um, so even if someone is really seasoned, don't be afraid to share your voice on that. Um, use our note system. So like sometimes we focus a lot on the trails, the lifts, um, those kind of like data points. But when you find something that works that's in this realm of things, like put that in the note or if it doesn't work, because we don't want to be reinventing the wheel every single time. Um, and maybe you won't be there next week or even if you think you will, it's really good to do it because you never know what comes up and um, people can kind of carry on what you've been doing. And this also goes with looking at the notes. So read back a few weeks and like look for games that worked and rewards that worked and um, if there were any problems think about what might have caused those and just kind of use the use the notes um, and then this is also kind of what Jake was bringing up before like it's okay to hold people accountable and promote independence and they don't have to be your absolute best friend like it's okay to set a boundary and be like that was unsafe and it really scared me and I'm not okay with it. And chances are like, they might be mad at you right then, but they're going to trust you more because you're there keeping them safe. Um, and so that kind of goes with the kid that Patrick took over. But then when I circled back with him, we were able to have a talk when he wasn't escalated <laughs> and be like, Hey, that really scared me. I couldn't keep up with you because I weigh twice as much and I was post holing in the snow and you got away really fast. And then he was like, okay, yeah, like that wasn't good. And, you know, now we, you know, we ski again the next week. So even if something does happen, like I really encourage you to try to work through things with your student and like show up again, because um, that is going to build trust over time and then seeking out support it's okay if you're stumped, you're not supposed to know what to do all the time. Um, oh yes, and then I should have printed out this case study, but let me see what I can do. All right, so I can, Um, I'm going to post a case study and then we'll do small groups again. And um, if you're here, you'll be able to like build some of our little manipulatives if you want, if it applies to the case um, or just come up with some ideas and then we'll come back and share. But I think I've got to paste it in the chat for people. I feel self-conscious with my screen on this thing. <laughs> Where is it? Yeah, if anyone needs a bathroom break, this is a really good time too. Um, or tea or water or whatever.
Okay. Okay, so the case is um, a 15 year old male who has Down syndrome. Um, I'll go back to sharing. And I pasted this in the chat so that hopefully you can see it um, when you go into breakout rooms, but he's 15 years old. He becomes frustrated and repeatedly sits down while you're instructing him on a gentle slope. So maybe one of the magic carpet areas at one of the mountains. Um, he has no safety awareness about this and sits in spots that are potentially in the way of other skiers. You notice that it's kind of whenever you touch him on the back to guide him, he leans into your hand and sits down. So um, using that case study, consider what might be causing that behavior. What sensory strategies could you use? What behavioral strategies could you use? And um, think of a few approaches because you often need to try more than one before finding what fits. And we can do it at the same tables and we can bring around the, um, if you wanna make a picture schedule, if that kind of feels like something that would help, um, you don't have to, but yeah. Let's kind of show you what they're like and maybe you'll, end up using them um, in the winter time. Then I'm gonna see if I can make breakout rooms. Two more, two, two, 
I'm not sure the first like, time you must have had some me. rewarding experience. Yeah. Like, is it like a. I don't know. Like, 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 like,
and extended family how to snowboard. And I, I do it a simple way. I, to describe it real quick, I just put my hands underneath their armpits, actually my up to about my elbow. And then <clears throat> I, I get them to feel my movement because they're right there with me the whole time. And if they start to fail, like they're going to fall or whatever, I can, I can lift them a little bit off the snow so they don't fall. But they can feel, you know, when they're close to me, they can feel my, you know, as I'm moving. And I think that helps a lot. And um, so she said that, you know, some of the kids will be non, you know, they'll be, you'll be told that they don't like to be touched. So that's going to impact a little bit of the way that I teach. But I'm looking forward to see how that, how that comes out of a few lessons. You know what I mean? How, how's that evolve? And. Uh, yeah. in your own style, you know, because I have a certain style and that may not apply to all of these kids. So anyway, yeah, I'm, that's looking, a really, I'm looking forward that's, to that. Yeah, that's a huge, awesome realization, um, too, is that you might like this toolkit that you've had in the past for teaching might mm -hmm. not be as applicable. So, yeah. Um, yeah, just to kind of expand that toolbox. And are you are you a new volunteer this year, Kurt? Yeah. Yes, I am. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So in your um your new volunteer yeah. training, you will get to break down these movements and like learn different ways of presenting like verbal, visual demonstrations and mm -hmm. and kinesthetic cues that involve less touching and more like movement of the equipment and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I think the worst my worst fear is when I was learning to snowboard, you take some pretty nasty falls, especially when you get on the wrong edge of this of the board and so having that person uh you know next to you um you can prevent that from happening i remember i almost quit snowboarding because i had i think multiple concussions from fall falling over backwards when i was learning how to do it so yeah those diggers can be hard yeah so i'm just I, I, i'm interested to see how it evolves like i said once you're out there yeah um, you know, and just and having somebody there next to you as a as a co uh, instructor, I think that's uh, that's a huge that's a huge deal. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Yeah, we look forward to having you out there. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I'm back to mute. <laughs> Anyone else want to share ideas? Like a background on each kid before we actually meet them so we're kind of a little bit prepared or is it going to be like it's surprise they might be verbal they might not and yeah it's a little bit of both um if you're signing up for like a multi-week lesson we will give you like a little bit about this is this person's interests um this is how they communicate those kind of things okay. um it's pretty not a ton of information, but kind of something to go off of. Um, when you get there, you may or may not have notes from a previous season. So you're always welcome to come like a little bit earlier if you want to make sure you get your hands on those notes and see things. Same thing if you're subbing. Um, there's always going to be some kind of packet with like the even on the application they put in um, any fear. Well, they put their goals, which are super important um things that motivate them fears concerns um behaviors that indicate like displeasure um and things like that are all kind of going into the application so you will see those yeah um and jody just said if you can find someone who knows the participant they'll be a great resource for you especially if they skied with them in the past so that's totally true. A lot of our skiers or snowboarders um, alike are kind of say skiers, but I mean all of it, um, have been coming for many years. So there is a lot of history and people who know them. Um, we know most of them. Um, and so it's great to lean on that. And it's also really important to allow like room for growth. So um, this kiddo that ran away from me and climbed the tree every year he's gone progressively better more well adjusted more regulated and so going into it with the open mind that he might be really successful is like so important um if you put somebody like if somebody is on that lesson that maybe 
is really triggered by it because they had a bad experience from three years ago. Um, like I kind of know those things and not to maybe put that match together because we want to leave that room for for growth too. Anything else coming up? Tell me what's email mount's number one priority lessons. Safety, fun, and learning. Oh, no <laughs> so that'll definitely get drilled into you. Um, safety is huge. If anything feels unsafe, like let us know. Um, fun, just like making it fun and silly and um, whatever fun is to that person too. Like maybe their fun is like very literal and checking off the trails on the map and it's not silly. Um, so like finding out what fun is for that person, safety, fun, and learning. And we're gonna give you as many tools as we can for, for coaching those ski progressions too. Cause a lot of the goals that are coming in um, as students are applying really are to progress to the next level or um, improve this in my skiing. So we kind of want it to be a package deal, but the order is safety, fun, learning. Yeah. Any other general like questions that are coming up about what to expect or anything like that? Yeah. So is it it can be different? Is it that people are uh, compared with the same person week to week, or that's only when there's a multi week lesson scheduled? Yeah. So um, it can really depend. Big Sky has um, two multi week sessions. So Saturdays up there, you might be on a multi week and see the same person. Bridger has a seven-week multi-week session that's basically between um, MSU winter break and MSU spring break. So it's those seven weeks. Um, if you sign up for that, you will be with the same person the whole season, which is really fun. Um, and if, you, if you're like, oh, I have one weekend I can't do, you can still sign up and we can work out subs for that. Um, and then there's going to be also a lot of destination lessons. So that person, we might not even know them yet. Um, or maybe they come back every year, but they only come out once a year, that kind of thing. Uh, so it, it varies, but there's definitely opportunity to be with the same person all the time. We have um, in the Bridger multi-week, we have 190 lessons. So <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a good chance you could get on a consistent lesson. Yeah. Um, the holiday lessons mm -hmm. for the week one, is that only for experienced volunteers yeah so if you are able to take your training during any of the next um not this weekend but the next two in big sky then you're eligible to sign up for those lessons but if you're in the training that's after new year's um you won't be trained up in time for that yeah um for big sky and or the bridge bowl would ride sharing be a thing for anybody? That's a really good question. Ride sharing? Huh? Oh, is ride sharing anything that like, I mean, people do it, like, but I don't know if we've ever organized ride sharing. Yeah. There's the Skyline bus that I take up there. So you can take a bus up from various points in Bozeman right to the ski hill, big sky. Five dollars each way, or you can get a punch card. It's even cheaper. Oh, okay. It makes a lot nicer than driving up and down yes, that canyon. Yes. Yeah, it's called the Skyline. Yeah, it picks up at MSU, um, Walmart, and um, the uh, one of the motels. It's super nice. This was the six motel six. Are the times line up right? If you go online. It, it has the whole schedule and it, it runs quite frequently. Yeah. It hasn't run well for the employees of Big Sky as well. So there's some like really, really early times and a little bit later. You just have to make sure when they switch to the less schedule in April. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and then Jody reminded us too that there's a Bridger bus too that. Um, picks up at the sub at MSU and the fairgrounds. Um, if you've used it in the past, they've moved from the muddy area of the fairgrounds and it's now on the pavement. So you approach it from the Tamarack side. 
Um, and that is a great option as well. It can be pretty rough on powder days because everyone is trying to get on it. But um, the many of our volunteers use the bus really successfully um, for Bridger. And the times might be like a little off, but you can always ski before or after your lesson too, um, if it doesn't line up quite, quite right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate everyone who came out tonight and who joined us online and um, all the participation and sticking with me through my nerdy OT background and facts. Um, I really enjoy it. I hope you guys got something out of it and uh, thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Colleen. Yeah. Sorry. Well done. Oh, thank you, Jody. You call me. Yeah.